Hey, Apple Friday. This week, Apple started making displays and potentially wireless chips for their iPhones. The dream of a dual screen Surface Duo is kind of dead at Microsoft, and Samsung has really weird ideas for the Galaxy S23 series. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. This video was sponsored by CuriosityStream in partnership with my streaming service, Nebula. First up in the brief, Nothing announced that the Nothing Phone 1 will come to the US in a really strange beta test. For $299, you can buy it, but bizarrely, you don't get US cellular bands, a warranty, or even a production operating system, and all you get is just hopes that it works. Pretty weird. Then reports are that Apple will eventually bring touchscreens for Macs, something that Steve Jobs once called ergonomically terrible and kind of tricky to balance with the iPad around. It would be an interesting U-turn for sure, though I don't quite know how they'd suddenly make macOS touch-friendly. Next, Fairphone announced that the Fairphone 2 will stop receiving updates at the end of March 2023 after an amazing seven and a half years of support, mostly without even help from Qualcomm. And as a perfect contrast to that, Meta ended support for their original Quest headset after less than four years. So yeah, boo Meta. I mean, you could buy the original Quest not very long ago, and I feel like Zuckerberg needs all the goodwill he could potentially get for his VR empire to be built, so I don't really understand this move. Anyway, Microsoft just released a Vol-E, I think that's how you pronounce it, I guess a cousin of the image generator AI Dal-E, and this one is a text-to-speech AI with a model that claims to accurately simulate a voice from just three seconds of audio sample, and demos on GitHub range from pretty bad to pretty darn realistic. He descended the ladder and found himself soon upon firm rock. They moved thereafter cautiously about the hut, groping before and about them to find something to show that Warrington had fulfilled his mission. Microsoft is also rumored to put another $10 billion into OpenAI to have more control over the likes of ChatGPT and DALL-E, of course, and there's news that there might even be a paid version of ChatGPT coming down the line. And in even more Microsoft news, the giant also switched its US employees from fixed paid vacation days to unlimited time off. It will be interesting to see if people actually take more or less time off now that there isn't a clearly allotted set of days anymore. I bet it's actually less. Then Intel finally shipped Sapphire Rapids, its long-awaited server chip that were some two years behind schedule. It's so late that it almost ran into the next generation server chips called Emeralds Rapids, which are also set to be released this year. Oops. And in a rare win for building regulations and the internet, England just made gigabit internet a legal requirement for new homes. Pretty badass. Okay, that's it for the brief, and for my first story of the week, we're gonna be talking about Apple bringing two of its most crucial iPhone components in-house. First, wireless chips. Bloomberg reported that Apple is working on a combined Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chip for the iPhone, aiming to replace what is a key component that it now sources from Broadcom. This is new, and in addition to Apple already having plans to replace Qualcomm's modems for cellular connectivity from 2024 or early 2025, after having constant fights with Qualcomm for years, and after buying Intel's 5G business back in 2019. Apple pays Broadcom almost $7 billion a year just for the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth elements, so it is a pretty major deal even if they'll have to continue licensing all kinds of Wi-Fi and Bluetooth patents. This means that Apple would bring essentially all wireless chip development in-house and it would leave only memory as the only major type of chip that they haven't done that with yet. And on top of that, there's also news about them doing the same with displays as well. This is yet another report from the usually very reliable Mark Gurman. The displays are expected to start shipping by 2024 and will start with micro LED displays for the Apple Watch Ultra. And from there, it will expand to the iPhone and its mixed reality headsets as well. Apple is apparently making small batches of the display in its own facility first and will expand to large scale manufacturing later. Micro LED is sort of the next gen display technology, which is inorganic, brighter, flexible, has ultra fast refresh rates, and so much more. And you might remember Apple buying a company called LuxView in 2014, which specialized in micro LED displays, which Apple has apparently developed since. Nobody's been able to make micro LEDs at very large scales at very reasonable costs yet, but I guess that's the goal now. 
At first, this rumor seemed very strange to me. Making displays is typically a low margin business with lots of direct competitors. You have these huge boom and bust cycles. You need huge scale for anything to work at all and so on. So I was kind of hesitant to believe it, but then I realized that Apple has kind of a different approach that might just work. Instead of designing and then manufacturing the display like most companies like Samsung and LG do, Apple will do what they do with their chips, which will likely mean researching the key technologies and then outsourcing the less lucrative manufacturing to others to compete over, which outsources the risks for Apple as well. And I can already see some fancy branding coming out of Apple as well, like Pro Optic X or Hyper Magic Display or something like that. If you have any good guesses about what they'll call these displays, let me know. Okay, my third story of the week is going to be the Surface Duo 3 giving up on the dual screen design and instead apparently adopting a foldable design. And I have a bit of a strong told you so energy about the story. <laughs> So Windows Central, which has reported on the Surface Duo pretty accurately for years, just broke the news that Microsoft apparently remains committed to the Surface Duo line, but isn't sticking with the dual screen design and instead going with a foldable. This isn't a huge surprise since neither the original Duo nor its successor actually sold well, despite some major improvements between generations and other manufacturers didn't jump on the form factor either, except maybe LG's now failed attempt. And so Microsoft had the very hard task of trying to get both the Android operating system and also the apps to work well on this custom form factor with very few users to justify any real investments. Neither the operating system nor the third-party apps received enough resources for taking full advantage of the two screens, while Microsoft's own software had tons of bugs and was often a few Android versions behind all the competitors as well. Microsoft wasn't initially crazy for wanting to avoid foldables while they had durability issues and were thick and heavy, but that segment has evolved much faster than the dual screen segment. Samsung foldables are now waterproof, unlike the Duo, and now can also work with an S Pen. Multiple foam makers have pretty much gotten rid of the crease, which was originally a huge problem, and Oppo and Xiaomi have recently released phones that could match the weight and thickness of normal phones this year already as well. Meanwhile, Google focused on building foldable features into Android itself rather than focusing on dual screen features, so Microsoft's idea was falling behind everyone even more. So the foldable form factor simply outgrew the dual screen form factor in a pretty major way, just like I predicted in every video that I made about the Duo. But still, I'm actually kind of excited to see what Microsoft will do once they decide to make a proper foldable. Will be exciting. Okay, my third story of the week is going to be weird news about the Galaxy S23 series, which by now we know more or less everything about. So Samsung confirmed a date of February the 1st for its first in-person unpacked event in the last three years. And it's almost certain that this is when we'll see the Galaxy S23 launch. Also new this week is that you can now already go to Samsung's own website that is linked in the description and make a pre-reservation with up to $100 in credit for pre-orders if you reserve both an unnamed Galaxy phone and a Galaxy Book laptop or $50 if you just reserve the phone. Not bad, I guess. And as a reminder, we already have official marketing photos showing off the device in four new colors, Phantom Black, Botanic Green, Mystic Lilac, and Cotton Flower, according to WinFuture's very reliable Roland Quant. And these images show off a slightly simplified design. And the main highlights for the specs are that there will be no Exynos version this year, only the excellent seeming Snapdragon 8 Gen 2 in all markets, plus a 200 megapixel main camera with heavy pixel binning, and leakers claiming that the image quality, especially in low light, is shaped up to be pack leading. Now pre-ordering a phone that isn't even announced yet feels like a very weird stab in the dark, especially when nothing has been said about the phone yet officially. But while you're in the description, you might actually find a much better use for both your time and your money, which is subscribing to Nebula and CuriosityStream. Nebula is our very own streaming service built and owned by many of my favorite educational creators that features our usual videos at free and early access and a bunch of exclusive Nebula originals as well. And I'm excited to say that it will soon feature quite a lot of extra Friday checkout content too. More on that a little bit later, but fun fact, we've just reworked most of our video streaming backend for Nebula, so videos should play back even smoother now. And we've also expanded to cover a lot more device types, so you can watch it pretty much anywhere that you would like. Nebula seems to be both growing and improving at such an amazing speed, I'm super happy that people seem to be liking it. And best of all, you can get Nebula for free if you sign up to my sponsor CuriosityStream for just $15 for an entire year. 
The sign up page is a little bit confusing, but if you use my link from the description, you can choose any Curiosity Stream plan that you prefer and you will automatically get Nebula with your order. You'll just receive an email after signing up with instructions for setting up your Nebula account. And Curiosity Stream itself is, of course, a great online service for high quality documentaries about science, history, nature, and more from fantastic hosts like David Attenborough and more. Check both services out at the link in the description. I hope you enjoy all the extra content and I'll see you next Friday.